Luke, how's it going with you? How's it going, Mike? Are you well? I'm not too bad, not too bad at all. Now, let's have a chat about your PhD years many years ago. So what was it like when you were a PhD student? And it was atrocious, Mike, as you know. It was appalling, wasn't it, back in those days? You remember yourself. Well, it was tougher in those days, but so much less was known then. We could just make it up. Anything you discovered was new because so little... Yeah. My main memory is they used to beat us more. Isn't that right, Mike? We're not allowed to beat the students. It's ridiculous. No, I mean, that's a joke. <laughs> um, um, well, I, I'm, I'm more than yourself. I remember extremely fondly. You know, I just remember this great freedom. I went to London to do my PhD. That was great getting out of Ireland. In 85, Ireland was a real dump, right? So I could get out of Ireland. Um, and in fact, half my class emigrated that year, which we all thought was very vivid. Several went to London, so I could hook up with them. I, I, I'd you know, already built a set of friends, I suppose. And I do remember uh, just the excitement of getting on a PhD, I suppose. You, that's what you remember, I imagine, as well. You know? Yeah, when I went, again, leaving, I left in 84, going from Trinity to Cambridge. And then yeah. the main thing I noticed was, I think it was good to leave and move somewhere else. So you knew, met new people. But also I was very lucky with my supervisor, Martin Brown, because he gave me tremendous freedom. So yeah, freedom we wouldn't usually give to a student details because we're under so much pressure to actually produce a paper in a certain area. So we were, so we were told, just go in there. There's some problems going on. Have a look around. Yeah. Something you can do. So you picked up on what was going on. And that was very interesting, but it was uh, challenging as well. Well, no, you're right. I mean, I, I vividly remember this sense of freedom, no question. And being in a different city was great. London was a great city to go to, I felt. And I really enjoyed that part. And I quite liked uh, the adventure of it going somewhere else. And then you're dead, right? I, I came up with my own project myself. My supervisor gave me a crappy project to begin with. It was about a herbal remedy for arthritis called fever few. Huh. And I knew within three months, this is a crock of shit. You know, <laughs> so it's dodgy herbal stuff. Although, ironically... The active ingredient in fever few is a sesquiterpene lactone, Mike, as a chemist, you would know what that is. And it was a thing called parthenolide, right? And that's an NLRP3 inhibitor, strikingly. So my, my work has kind of come full circle since then. But I got out of that project quickly. And by within three or four months, I invented my own project. You're quite right, we'd freed them, hadn't we? We were able to come up with our own ideas. And in fact, in many ways, you're expected to do that, weren't you? Did you feel that, Mike? You weren't spoon fed in any way. It was, just, it was quite different because we don't want to talk going down memory lane too much. Um, but what was very interesting in a good sense was that you had a project which was just maybe you and your supervisor, the only people on the paper, and very small groups of people working together quite intensively. And what's really changed now for the groups in my lab at least is the collaboration. So we've got huge football teams on the papers. And yeah. Everyone has a part. And so well, you lose one aspect of control of the project, but then you gain hugely by all the interdisciplinary stuff, working with chemists and surgeons and clinicians. So I think in many ways it's better now in terms of training because yeah. part of a team, you're getting influence from lots of people. So in our day, if you were lucky that your supervisor in the lab was good, that was fine. But if you're the yeah. supervisor- I don't know. I mean, I think that the core skill of a scientist actually is to get a good idea, mm. first of all, and then go and do the experiments and try to see if the idea is correct and getting the data and then interpreting it. That's never changed. That was always the way, as you would agree, back in our day as well. Yeah. And I, I think I prefer the sink or swim model because you don't want everybody doing PhDs and postdocs either, you know? It should really only be the ones who really want to do it. And back then we went into it because we really wanted to be scientists. We really had a passion to be researchers, I think, you know? Whereas nowadays it's like third level became fourth level kind of thing in a way. So that's one thing I don't like about what's happened. And, you know, and I think, um, my memory was this, it was like this great love of it in a sense and a great passion for it sort of you know obviously we were getting pissed as well but um do you know what i mean I, 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 now again we're like two old men complaining about the the, the young people nowadays yeah. bloody old. I don't know they're born. <laughs> i think what has changed you're right mike that's made it better is the technology yeah we were using a piece of wood with a nail in it kind of looking back on it now you know and then secondly, the, the, the PubMed business. Remember, it's a trace to the library a lot and all the endless photocopying and stuff. So that, that's a big difference, I think, with nowadays. But I, I still believe, though, that the fundamentals of being a scientist are obviously the same. Yeah, I think it's in some ways more exciting now because you're part of a bigger team, you're getting more inputs. And that can be overwhelming. Certainly, I'm not sure I've been able to cope with all the 
the stuff that my current PhD students are coping with in terms of having to keep up with so many different disciplines. Yeah. It was very clear we were learning in this particular area. And um, although coming back to the environment, what was very good was the, was the ability to just say, well, try something, see what happens. Yeah. I'm not sure we can give our students that much freedom now. It's, it's I think the big change as well, Mike, was the tyranny of publishing was different, you know? So there was no impact yeah, yeah. factors. And I, I think impact factors are where the most malign developments in our profession, I think, because as you well remember, to get a biochemical journal paper was a really thrilling thing to get back then, you know? Yeah. That journal didn't change, you know? Yeah. And yet it was seen as lesser somehow. So, and, and it's, it's a bit like the pressure on younger people now, it's all about that kind of thing, you know? And monitoring and metrics and all. There were no real metrics in our, back then, as I remember. And we knew the good journals, of course we did. I'm not being stupid, but but there was let, less focus on that, actually, I felt, you know? Yeah, I do remember that we, we went to one journal with a single word title begins with N, and it was just <laughs> me and my supervisor. Um, which Anna, you, Mike, you got a nature paper out of your PhD. You, yeah. you might as well tell people about that. Well, it was, it was interesting because it was, it was so different from nowadays that you would stumble on something you had some techniques that worked and you got something out that yeah was an interesting problem and you send it off and that was it whereas now if you go to nature these days normally you come straight back yeah uh, by return by return or even <laughs> unopened essentially <laughs> um, but also the number of people you have on it the, the number of experiments you've got to do to get it through to the next level that kind of thing so those things have changed dramatically they have i think so yeah well in, in many ways what we do became big science a bit like the physicists had for years anyway in a sense isn't it so it's i quite enjoy it now from this perspective because i'm interacting with so many fun people in different disciplines who know yeah things i know nothing about that's great collaborating with the chemists and the, the surgeons the clinicians now one question i'm often asked is how is it setting up um, your lab for the first time, and I was there when you were setting up your lab for the first time, Luke. So you were you had your own lab, Mike. What are you talking about? You'd set one up already. <laughs> yeah, to some extent. Yeah. So, uh, what are your views on setting up a lab? Any advice for? Yeah. Well, I always think that as as we go through life, you get a new set of challenges all the time, and then you can't cope initially. Okay, so. And it begins in primary school, and then you go to secondary school. Oh God, that's a new thing. And then university, you get your degree. Then you have got to go and do a PhD. That's a different skill set again. And you've got to master that new set of skills. Then you go and do a postdoc. The most luxurious time, I think, in our lives is always the postdoc years because hopefully you know what you're doing. You're probably living somewhere interesting that you're intrigued by and you can do really good science. So that, that's, that's the idyllic, even though postdocs watching this mightn't think that, that that was the idyllic time. And then the next challenge is set your own lab up. A whole new set of skills again. And then you got to master those skills. And, and it's the things like management and grants and supervising people for the first time and that sort of thing, you know. So, so I think my memory of it was, uh, it, was it wasn't was easy initially. It took a good few months to get used to that shift. The big shift is no longer working at the bench, actually, I think, Mike, as well. Yeah. And you hate that. And I, I, to be honest, I wasn't a fan of lab work, I must admit. I was reasonably good at it, you know. But then suddenly someone else is doing the experiment, not you. And that's a challenge because you got to trust them. I got to trust them. Yeah. You said something to me, Mike, very early on when we first met, I think, you know, yet another great idea destroyed by a graduate student. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because, and you've raised the grant. Like, can you imagine, maybe this was how, in this context, you've sweated blood to get a grant, right? Mm -hmm. Very competitive. You get your first grant, you take on someone and they just don't care or they don't, or whatever. I hate to be nasty, but yeah. You know, it unravels because the person in your lab isn't doing it in the right way. And then that money's gone. And don't you realize? So what you have to learn when you're on a lab for the first time is don't get nasty with your people. Don't treat them like machines that are da generating data, you know. And you're inclined to think along those lines when you start out because you've raised the bloody grant money. And, and that's up to them to go and do something. And then you're not doing the bench work anymore. So to me, that was um, a challenge early on, I think. It's hard to expect students or the others to be as passionate or engaged. And so you have to have a distance, I guess. To train them, to bring them out, and also you've got a big judgment about. We're often not asked as well. I think one of the things we'd like to cover is uh, when you're recruiting PhD students, yeah. postdocs. What are, what are we looking for? And I'm always looking for. First off, I'm looking for someone who I can actually work with. In the good old days, pre-COVID, of course, you'd be interacting with them every day. You yeah. make sure that someone you think, oh God, I have to face this person every day. And so the first thing you're looking for is, can you interact? 
Yep. It could be a brilliant person, but if you can't interact with them, get ideas and stuff like exactly. that, it's very tricky. So that's the first thing I would look for. What do you think? Oh, no. Well, I, I mean, I realized after the first year of running my own lab, your single most important skill is recruitment. And in fact, I would go as far now. Obviously, got to raise the money. That that's not easy either, uh, and get the ideas going. That 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 part of it. That's that, that's obviously that's that's the number one thing. But then after, if you recruit the wrong people, you're doomed, because you're stuck with them. First of all, right? You have an obligation to them, especially the PhD students, and 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 it just makes your life really difficult. And I, I, no more than yourself. We've had a couple of duds over this. We won't name them, <laughs> but and and these people are often good people. They're, they're often fine. They're in the wrong business. You know, they just they, they shouldn't be doing a PhD and then you've recruited them. So so it's tough that and, and, and my number one tip to anybody setting up their own lab is spend a huge amount of time on recruitment and be very careful. Now, we've all got different ways of doing it. And, and, and some people what do you do, Luke? What do you do? Well, some people do psychometric analysis. I get the CIA involved. You No, I don't. Um, I, I interview them face to face is absolutely. Well, first of all. They got to have a good CV to make the cut. Let's start. And I'm looking at early on. Of course, you can't recruit good people because you're pretty useless yourself. <laughs> success breeds success. So early on, I suppose, um, look at the CV. It looks reasonable. Then I'd sit down with them for a good two, three, four hours. You know, and I get them to give a presentation, maybe, and just drop into the conversation, project ideas. You suss out pretty quickly are they engaged? I find, you know, and then I'm looking for a level of competence there and knowledge. And, and if the project is on metabolism, as an example, I hope they've done their homework and know some of the stuff, you know. Um, and then I'm looking for the, a spark of some kind. You know, I'll try to see, could this person come up with an idea? Could they be a self-starter? Mm -hmm. I explain to them how I run a lab and see if that gels with them. But, but a huge element, Mike, as you would agree, is you got to click with them, with their personalities as best you can. Now, you've only got two or three hours with them. So you, if you feel you can't get on with them or it's going to be too difficult, then forget it. It could also be across the they might not get on with us. I mean, it's hard to... Well, no, Jesus, no, don't get me wrong. I mean, <laughs> I, everybody who's worked for me, Mike, they have my sympathy. I suppose it's the best way to put it. Um, and, uh, and then the other issue then is sometimes I would have recruited people who are the same. I would call them ninjas. So they're a bit strange. You don't have to be friends with them. That's a really important fact, actually. Uh, they're not supposed to be your friend. You, you've got to be their manager, in a way. I call these people Roy Keane, you know? So in other words... You can't stand them, but they score goals. Okay, so so you got to get a balance right between a really talented person who's very, you know, able and so on, and you may not get on with them, and you got to get that nuance right, and that takes a bit of effort, I suppose, to suss that out as well. Yeah, what often I found useful is to get the candidate, one who might be coming to, to either visit the lab and check out yeah. there when, I, when I'm not around, and often I ask them just to have a Zoom these days or a chat with another PhD or another postdoc in the lab with me out of the loop so they can just yeah. ask their own questions and of course there will be feedback from those people and often yeah. what, that's very revealing because the things they ask yeah are very revealing about what they're into what they really want to get out of the time that's right mike i'll give you one one recent example of that in my lab i i, I always get the postdocs actually usually to interview them for two reasons one is because they should have they should participate in the recruitment process as well they feel more part of it and their opinions are very valid i interviewed a woman I won't give any more information. Uh, and she looked really good, like good CV. And she came to visit the lab. I think she was from a European country. That's what it that way. Flew her over, paid her airfare and everything. Gave a good lab, gave a good talk. And then she talked to the postdocs. And one of the postdocs said to me, oh, the first thing she asked me was, can I take six weeks off in the summer? <laughs> that was the question she asked me. Now, that almost was the end of it. Not quite. Yeah. I didn't take her on anyway. But but you're quite right, though. It's really good to get, get other people in your lab. Yeah, it yeah. gives them a chance to ask, is Murphy a weirdo? You see? So that's useful as well. So. That is a, a contract that precludes them from answering that question. Yeah. Perfect. Um, related, uh, often we've had some fantastic people go through our labs. And I know some of the people, I won't name names again, but I know some of the fantastic people who've gone through your labs. You know, some of the great people who've gone through my labs. And I'm so... You know, some of them are such high flyers that they've learned so quickly, far, far smarter than me. I'm trying to think of the traits they had that I wish I'd had when I was. Yeah. The things that really stood out for me were that the ability to choose the key problem and do the key experiment. Uh, and other people I've had who are incredibly intelligent couldn't do yeah. the list of experiments to do and think none of these are important, they're going to answer the question. So I don't know what you think about the traits 
from people. Yeah, people. no, you're, I agree 100%. 100%. I mean, in fact, two of our ex people are working together now, aren't they? It's great to see a double act there that they got together. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right. It's a funny one, isn't it? In a sense, the ones that became like, star. They're going to go to Stockholm. <laughs> they're going to go to Stockholm. Very disturbing. Yeah. Very disturbing. No, but the, 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 yeah, I mean, the ones that, that really became stars, I, I, could, I could comment on that a little bit. Um, a big thing that stood out for me with those people was they would defy me sometimes. And say that's a stupid idea. <laughs> I'm not working on that. Now that takes a bit of guts, doesn't it? Let's face. And I've had two or three recently. I won't name them either, but uh, they were really good then because they said, "Look, remember one of them said to me, Luke, I'm not buying your bullshit." <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Now they were right because we, we and, and and the big trait they need, Mike and you, they they only got one project to worry about, right? We've got six, seven, eight projects in our mind, so. They should be better than you at the project. They should have more insight. So if that's working, that's great. You know, that means they're really engaging with it, I think. Um, and then you just get it. I mean, I think, I think as ever, they know how to do the experiments in the right time and the, the right controls, all that basic lab stuff. They're very good at that. Extremely well read, which is a really important part of this as well, of course, you know, and yeah, which, which yeah, I must say, the old Phil Cohen mantra, you got to read at home, not in the lab. That's how, you know. So in other words, you got they got to be absolutely up in the field. So those kinds of things. That would stand out for me, I think, in terms of the traits. And obviously a very high level of intelligence, but you're right, it's a mix of things. So one of the questions I'm often asked um, in a conference and so on is, how do you get the balance between your work and how to do the admin and the research? Because like I, in my current position, I'm not doing much teaching apart from, from PhD students. I love the teaching I did before. Um, admin, I've never been a great fan of that. In some aspects, are okay. But getting the balance there, I was told early on, the secret in academia is to, uh, when you're an enthusiastic and young person, is to, is to volunteer to do a very tedious administrative task. Do it enthusiastically, but incredibly badly. <laughs> but they never ask you to do it again. Now, I'm afraid I can't dump my colleagues in it, so I do try and do what I... Yeah, but what I found also is that the word "no" is quite a good word to have. Uh, yeah, you can't do everything. So I'm just wondering how you, because you've you've got a lot of leadership roles, yeah, tech roles. How do you balance all of those different competing interests? I think it's tough when you're young because if you're taken on, say, as an academic in a department, you know, you got to be collegiate and you've got to do stuff with your colleagues and so on. It can be hard to say no. Then here, here's my advice on this, Mike. All young young investigators, postdocs, and young academics, research comes first. Never forget that. Number one is never, ever stint on your research program. Who cares if you ran a good course for the second year hairdressers could agree? You know, um, not that I'm aligning hairdressers, by the way. That's fine as well. But, but n number one, every, every decision you make should be through the prism. Will it affect my research? That's the first thing. Now, you have to be collegiate. You've got to do admin. You've got to do a bit of teaching. You've got to volunteer for things to be a good colleague. And especially when I get promoted, and you might want to get promoted in the system as well. So you need all that in your CV too. Try and pick the stuff you enjoy. So early on in, in the good old days, I think I ran the postgraduate thing for a while. I quite liked that as a job, you know, and seem less onerous than doing 53 practicals for the dental histology students. So, so be tactical, you know, try to pick stuff that you might actually enjoy. You've got to do some of this and just try and limit it. The more successful you are in research, the more slack you will be cut away from other things as well. And then the other thing, you have to master time management. And, and it's obvious every walk of life has this. Yeah. And early on, like maybe I was in the job about five or six years. Somebody sent me a book on, you know, how to handle multiple demands, multiple deadlines, multiple whatever. You know, it's a very clever title in this book. And you got to get the balance between them all right. Yeah. And, and the Doug Green, who was mentioned earlier, he, he wrote a great piece. You oh, yeah. feed the wolves. Yeah. So a wolf comes in feed that wolf, he goes away. Next wolf comes in, feed that wolf, he goes away. You have to be organized. You got, you got to plan your schedule carefully. But remember, you won't get frustrated. You won't get pissed off. You won't get demotivated as long as research is in your mind the whole time. That, that's, that's the advice I was give people. That's, that's good because um, you can't do everything. No. You can't do everything perfectly. So you have to say, well, I'm going to spend three, you know, two afternoons preparing this grant. Yeah. And then it goes. I'm not going to keep come back, keep coming back. Yeah. You have to just say there's a limit, and it's probably 95% done. It could be 99% done if I spend another week at it, but that's yeah. not 
I think a good way to think about it is this. Think about how will your day-to-day activities benefit your department? I know that sounds a bit altruistic mm-hmm. in a sense. But like, you know, so in other words, you might introduce a new topic on a degree program. Be novel, be innovative, you know. Think up new ways of helping your department. That's new. I mean, we're scientists. What makes, a science, what makes science special, I think, is we're hungry for novelty, remember. So if you bring in a new angle, organize a conference, what is life like 1993 yeah. remember that one we i were do. so young then and that was your idea of course yeah. which i ripped you off on but that well, was a super well well that was a superb i see penrose won the nobel prize today see that Mike? yeah i saw that that was very good but that was a fantastically great thing to do it was very new our department loved it the university thought it was great we really enjoyed it yeah you, you could say oh i'm spending time on this to dodge some other crappy job you know so, so be strategic in your thinking as to how you use your time is another key piece of, of, of guidance i would give people yeah that's true a lot of the admin you take on particularly outside the department you do learn a lot so i've learned huge amounts being on grant committees and promotion boards and also scientific advisory boards you learn a huge amount yeah interacting with you do you do absolutely in fact i did that as well and um like being an editorial board of a journalist, yeah, yeah. even though it's a bit of a chore when you're older, <laughs> yeah. when you're young, it's fantastic because yeah. you learn about the business, you get ideas going, you meet people, all that stuff is great, absolutely. Yeah, no, there's lots of fun things to do, um, but you can't do everything. And as you say, you're going to be judged if you're not publishing, researching, and yeah. conferences, you're going to fade away. And uh, that's... Well, by, by far, the biggest thing you can do, and you know this, like in spades, the biggest thing by far you can do is to make a really important discovery. That mm-hmm. trumps everything else. Mm-hmm. Like setting up a new degree program, reordering the Excel spreadsheet for the second year biochemistry undergrads, mm-hmm. you know, and these are important things, mm-hmm. but you won't get remembered for that kind of thing. You know? <laughs> if you that's make true. a big discovery, that, that really counts. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, sometimes... Uh, we're looking, people often ask about that work habits. And one of the things we're asked about is how do you keep up with the reading? Now, you, especially in an interdisciplinary area like inflammation, and my work goes to all sorts of different areas, you just can't keep up with the literature. What I often do is people in the lab will send me papers, I'll skim lots of papers, and often re- uh, reviewing grants and reviewing papers in the top journals. That gives you an insight into what's going on. But I don't know what your approach is to trying to keep up to date with stuff. Well, I've got a, I've got a voracious appetite for four or five things in my lab at the moment. I've always been like this, by the way. Mm-hmm. So every day I search on PubMed, actually, with these key terms, honest to God, you know, and I keep up with the papers. Not, not because I'm trying to be smart. It's just I'm looking for new stuff to come out, you know. So I've got like four or five keywords always on the go. Mm-hmm. And I'm always searching with those keywords. Mm-hmm. And then it. PubMed came along because in our day, Mike, you went to the library and got Index Medicus. Remember that? Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but as soon as PubMed was invented, that was superb. Mm. And then I've got Twitter. I follow lots of things on Twitter. I find Twitter very useful, actually, for science. I follow all the journals and they tweet the papers, you know. Mm. So I keep up with things that way. Um, what I miss with the bloody lockdown, Mike, is not going to conferences. I found yeah. that to be a superbly useful yeah. thing because you, you would go to talks outside your area. You'd mm. meet people in the bar afterwards and chat to them and and, and it's funny how ideas come in. Again, Doug Green, he calls it a mental smoothie. You know, in other words, it goes into your brain unexpectedly. You, and by just dumb luck, you, went to, you happen to be sitting in the wrong room or something, you know, and there was some speaker. Oh, that's interesting. And of course, what you're trying to do is link different areas together that wouldn't be linked before. That's a real trick in this, in all of advanced of science in many ways is bringing different things together that weren't in the same sentence, shall we say. So I find that I'm missing that now. That, that's one thing that I'm unhappy about because you need to meet i think it's very important for scientists to meet face to face actually yeah. so even though we're antisocial, or some of us are anyway um yeah. Yeah. you know well, you can't beat that off the cuff chat yeah and you get it in your colleagues as well to some extent and in your own lab has it i mean that we, yeah. we we're still managing to have a lab meeting it, it's it'd be four or five people in a room distance the rest are on zoom and so that, that's an important forum for this as well, I think. So all those little tricks. But you got to keep up with the literature. I mean, you know, as, as, as we t- tell our students, if you're not on top of the literature for your project, you shouldn't be in this business. You know, you should be doing something else. Yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting what you're saying about the lockdown, because certainly for me during the lockdown, I had a big backlog of papers, and that was pretty efficient working through those without interruption. But it becomes a bit dead after a while. You oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you're sort of working through ideas that are being sorted out. 
you're not getting that stimulation. And the yeah. conferences for me were really good for that. And yeah, I think it wasn't for the lectures, it was the interaction over the posters yeah. and the, in the bar. But very but, often the talks, the talks and the, the seminars weren't that informative sometimes. It was stuff afterwards that you got stuff out of, you know. Yeah. But I find you've realized, I mean, not 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 so, this is only one example of it. As human beings, we need to socialize even if it is a, a, an awkward cup of coffee with someone or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, it's so important. And, and in fact, without that, then science will suffer, I think. So let's hope we can begin to get back to some kind of uh, interactions. I don't think the, um, the fact I've done, I've given lots of talks by, by Zoom now it's a, at conferences that, that went online. In fact, I've given talks in Albuquerque, Arizona and New York in the last two weeks by Zoom, though. You know, it's supposed to be there in person. It's not great. That won't, that can't go on forever. No, you, you know? don't get any feedback from Zoom. No. It's a very dead experience. Very you know? dead. Yeah, exactly. So that's quite intriguing, though. Yeah. So um, often uh, people have asked me as well, you know, what advice would you give to your younger self when you were starting out? And I think, God, yeah, the career was, it wasn't really planned. It sort of wandered around a lot. So there's no, yeah, lots of things I could think I should do. But what do you think, Luke? What would you well, think? Mike, as you know, I'm now a celebrity, apparently. Yeah. Uh, I always was to you, I know, but uh, I was interviewed by this Irish independent and there was a question like that, 10 questions, you know, one, so what advice would you give your 20 year old self? I said, don't take advice from a 56 year old. That was, uh, that was my response. Um, but putting that to what, but you remember your famous Jonathan Swift, didn't he have a, advice to his younger self? Oh, yeah. So he had, a, he had things, a list of things he would read out um, to advice to my older self he wrote when he was young. And these were things like, Never pretend that a younger woman can love you for yourself. Never <laughs> yeah. fight the children just for the sake of it. So I think that's a, a, yeah. a warning to us all. It is. It is. I, I, if I was to say, uh, what would I say? I, you know, I don't know. I, I, think, I think I learned as I went along a bit anyway. You know, I think pr probably would say, as, I just, as I've been saying in a sense, you know, and you've said it yourself, if you're in an academic post, you've got to say no to things. You've got to be, be a bit selfish. Think about your research as a primary thing. Secondly, and this is like a truism for all of us, don't sweat the small stuff, you know. Don't get so anxious if you're not getting on with one of your students, say, because we'd often labor, oh, am I doing the wrong thing there? Don't be worrying about things too much, I think is a big piece of advice. It's a long game, remember, and, you, and if, if you don't get the grant, and you're going to get your ass kicked all the time. Papers are going to be rejected all the time. And yeah, you yeah. will have people in your lab who drive you demented. You know, um, that's part of the business. Don't be worrying. Just keep at it because it will get better. And, and, and we know this. Get, up, get, get back up on the horse. You've got to keep getting. And it's a, it's a tough business to be in because especially when you're starting out, you will have lots of disappointments. Just get back up on the horse. Keep going. And, and, and because when you get older, you realize if you, I mean, some of my papers took freaking eight years to get to finish, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you stuck at it. Yeah. So I think that's another obvious thing in a way. But I would say to my say to my younger self, don't be. I mean, think about the things I was worried about. There was no need to worry about those things at all. You know. Of course, it's a it's a tricky business. Because I remember, you know, Linda Partridge, very famous uh, scientist working on aging. So yeah. Similar a question. Of course, you. It's a, an impossible question to to advise because if you follow the advice. It's like yeah. that in time. Yeah, and yeah. You, you turn out to be a different person because you're the sum of all the weird turns and that you, yeah. got, that you did. And also, of course, a related issue is that people write their life histories backwards. They sort of assume yeah. their history led up to your wonderful That's story. right. Yeah. So much of it was random and luck. Seren serendipitous. Complete yeah. serendipity. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it was yeah, a, different, uh, in a different way. Who knows how long it would have. I would, I would say one other thing. I mean, I think younger people now who are young academics have it much tougher than us, definitely. Oh, God. They're, they're being put upon hugely by so many demands, you know. And I would resist that. I would, I would form a union and I'd march and say, look, I'm not having this crap, you know. <laughs> and, and they often haven't got the guts to do it because they're anxious about their promotion prospects or their status, that worry. That's another piece of advice. Like, never worry about your status. Don't worry, you know, that that guy's better than you because he's probably not going to be that good next week, next year or whatever it is, you know, but I think young academics are under severe pressure now and it's unacceptable. I think I, I worry about the world we've invented for them in a sense, because it's just, there's too much. And I think there'd be no harm if the whole system got a shake up now because of COVID and could get restructured in some way. It's a good point because I agree that the young academics have an incredibly tough time because they've got so many pressures. And yeah. so many of these extraneous things to deal with, uh, you know, um, contact and 
presentation yeah. and public engagement, all of which are good, but they're all incredibly very much secondary to the research. And yes, sort of a, a research angle, and it doesn't have to be brilliant, but at least it has to be something that they associate with you. The key thing, I think, is to get an angle. Yeah, or leading in. There's no point just following someone else. And no, my 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 number one piece of advice, Mike, to my former trainees, as they're called in America, my PhD student postdocs, you've got to get a name in something. Mm. You know, in other words, Joe Blogs is known for this. Yeah. Now, when you're young, it, it, it's not going to be a huge thing, is it? But at least you'll be known for, you know, some aspect of NF Kappa B or whatever it might be. You know, and then then your name begins to build. Yeah. And you've got to eventually end up as being a name, if I can use that in the broadest sense. I mean, you won't get a big grant from the Welcome Trust, Mike, or from the ERC unless Mike Murphy is known as this, you know. So you got to head in that direction. Build your CV early on, uh, your brand. I know it sounds awfully corporate, but, uh, you know, build, build a brand around you, that what you're good at, you know, and then people want to talk to you and people want to collaborate with you. That's very, it's very hard to find that, you know, but, but you will get there eventually. Your, your postdoc should really be about that, to be honest, I think. Yeah. So it's starting to build that niche, that, that area that you're going to be known for, you know? I think that's a key thing. That bit of advice is key to that you're, you've built up a, an area that's unique. And when people leave the lab, what you want to make sure is that they're, they're not just carrying on. They're, they're, and I think we've seen that with people who've left our labs. Yeah. The very ones we know who've done really well. They've been very clever in stepping a bit to the side, using what they've done in the past. Yep. Seeing a niche that's interesting, has some legs to it. But they yeah. can exploit it where it's not just seen, oh, he's they're just finishing off what they did for their postdoc. They've exactly. Really, they can really grow. Yeah. And that's far more exciting and fun to do anyway, to do a new area. Yeah. And, and the beauty is, Mike, as you would agree, it's all data led anyway. I mean, w when you get a paper, it's a piece of data that you've managed to encapsulate in a publication. That should be a sort of a, a, a little milestone on the road to this. In other words, that paper will lead to something else based on that data. You know, you might go down a different road slightly and then gradually. And we're lucky, I guess, you and me or people have said this to me, but they're blowing smoke up our collective asses here. We, we were able to kind of define new aspects in fields, you know, and got associated with that. For me, it was innate immunity. That revolution in innate immunity began. And I was lucky enough to get on that bandwagon and begin to, you know, yeah. make, 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 a, make, a, make a play of that. And then and I guess the most recent is the immune metabolism areas. The other one you might we might list. So so that, that's the ultimate goal is to get to get associated with it. And Doug Green, we keep mentioning him, cell death. I mean, when, when he began, I know Doug, we both know Doug very well. When he began cell death, it was a pretty, it wasn't a mainstream area, you know, and he managed to define that area in a niche and got going on it. You know, it's fantastic. So, so the younger scientists should have that in their mind. What, what, what do I, it's a bit like where you pick to do a PhD, by the way. You pick something you like, you pick an area that you like to look at, you get going on it, you know, and then you're going to extend that into research and then into, into a, a niche, an area of research that would be, that you will own, you know. And just working on choosing, having the right choice, choose something that's important, some legs. Yep. I remember, uh, you know, there are only two rules in biology, two absolute rules in biology. Always number your tubes and work on something important. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so simple, isn't it? It's just so simple. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure how important it is about the tubes either, to be honest. No, no. Well, I remember, like, here, I know we're banging on about our reminiscences. I remember, I remember vividly when I was doing my PhD in London, you knew a pharmacologist because he'd hold up an Eppendorf and he'd say, is that going into solution? <laughs> that, that was a pharmacologist. A molecular biologist, you're pipetting invisible volumes of liquid. <laughs> you know, that's how you knew you're a molecular biologist. You know, yeah. a biochemist, of course, was in the cold room with large columns trying to purify things. So there was, yeah. was kind of, you know, <laughs> there was obviously indicators of each specialty. Uh, back in the good old days, yeah. It will be interesting to see how, uh, it's quite fun seeing how the people who've left your lab, how they're doing, and our plan is to have them s situated around the world. <laughs> yes, I can go and just uh, bounce from lab to lab. And, uh, no, well, actually, here's one for you that I like, Mike. I meet them. I think something like 20 of my people have got their own lab, something like that. And you meet them and they, they, they complain. They say, oh, it's tough. And my student is useless. And, you know, and this postdoc was hopeless. And I said, look, I was like that. I had to put up with this shit. Just suck it off. You know? yeah. <laughs> but your, jo your job is to kind of be like a parent and encourage them. I like that. I like that. That's one thing I find especially satisfying in my yeah, career that. is seeing them. It's about like being a parent as well seeing them leave home and build a home for themselves and then and then and then they realize that 
what you did for them, kind of. You know what I mean? It's funny, you know, because when they're in your lab, they don't see this side of it, you see. Here's another quick piece of advice that I've just remembered, Mike. Um, never complain down, only complain up, okay? Yep. So you should never complain to your graduate students, your post, like, oh, this department is shit. This equipment is hopeless. You know, the head of the department is crap. You know, never, ever do that. You just complain up. Yep. Go to the head of the department and say, this department is shit. Because if you complain down, they will lose faith in you as a leader. And, and they will think it is really shit if you're complaining. So it's a very important trait is to put on a brave face if you're the head of an app. Now, some days you're in a bad mood and it's, it, leak, it leaks out, you know. Um, but by and large, try to avoid, uh, you know, being complaining, I guess, to your team, especially. There's a piece of advice. If you, have, if you take that advice, it'll, it'll, you go a long way, I think. Yeah, no, those are, those are all good points, I think. Yeah. Remember, if we're doing advice here, I remember Peter Medewer wrote something he wrote. that. says... Uh, um, one best bit of advice he would have for a scientist is never believe, no matter how strongly you believe in something, that's no evidence that it's true. Yeah. So you can, we can fall in love with our hypotheses because they're so beautiful and elegant. Exactly. And you're yeah. trying to do experiments to prove them. Yeah. And the key thing is, another guy, Salvador Moncada, always used to say, the key thing is to do the brutal experiment as early as possible. So yeah. You try and kill off your idea. You know, do yeah. The, you know, the, key experiment as early as possible and waste time because after a year there's a lot of nice data that sort of agrees with it yeah mm -hmm. yeah you're exactly yeah i think the, you can paraphrase matter i don't believe your own bullshit that's yeah he was a bit more elegant but, uh, he was uh, yeah he was a, he very learned as early dyke man you know he wouldn't use the word bullshit wouldn't you? <laughs> okay so i think um that's been very interesting chatting to you luke and bringing back some of the Yes, good chatting to you again, Mike, and uh, reminiscing about those good old days when life was much simpler. Yeah, when a PhD meant something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, precisely. You might have some more advice in a written form to share with people. Oh, thank you. I'm going to plug the book. Never mind the bollocks. Here's the science. It looks like a mirror th to me, but uh, yes, everybody should buy this book. Forget everything me and Mike have said. It was all bullshit. All you need to know is in this book, okay? Just buy this book. So that's <laughs> Great. Okay, good to chat to you, Luke. Good to chat to you too, Mike. Indeed. I'll see you soon. All right. Bye. All the best.